Before we begin this morning, I want to tell you that Doug and I will be traveling tomorrow to Memphis, Tennessee for our uh, General Assembly for the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. They'll be gathering there, and this will be our first time as uh, the new cornerstone in the EPC denomination. So we're looking forward to that. We'd love for you to be praying for our meeting and for uh, the time that we'll have there. And we're serving on uh, various committees uh, and we'll be gathered together for the whole week. So we'll be coming back Friday night, but we'd love for your prayers during that time as well. But we're looking in the book of James and continuing our study uh, in this wonderful book. And I hope you've been enjoying hearing what the Lord desires for us to have, that it would be wisdom that would be ours, that we all we have to do is ask, and James has told us that we just pray and ask the Lord for wisdom when we notice when we don't have it, and I think James is making it very clear that we are people that are most need of wisdom. I've seen it as I prepare my sermons. I'm sitting there going, wow, James is really hitting me hard with what he's speaking to me about. And so as we continue our study, we want to continue to understand that the word of God is like a mirror. It's going to be reflecting our heart. It's going to show us where we are in relationship to God's word. And he's going to do it again today to talk about uh, part of wisdom, and that it's worthy of our pursuit. It's what the Lord desires for us to be always looking for. We do want to be wise because wisdom is going to help us know how to live in this world and how to survive through all the struggles and difficulties that we may experience while we live upon this earth. The book of Proverbs was the Old Testament book of wisdom, and James is considered the New Testament book of Proverbs. But I want you to hear a passage from Proverbs uh, chapter 13 and verse 20. It says this, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Now, Solomon was the writer of the book of uh, Proverbs. He was trying to instruct young boys. It was like a father teaching a son on how to live and how to be wise. And wisdom was given to Solomon. When the Lord said, Solomon, let me give you whatever you ask for. It's sort of that idea of I dream of genie. Do you remember that show? Uh, the idea that you could ask and your wish would be fulfilled. Well, Solomon had one of those experiences. And then the Lord said, Solomon, what would you ask for? And Solomon paused and contemplated. And his answer was that I would be given wisdom. And the Lord said, because you have asked for wisdom and you didn't ask for riches, you didn't ask for bettering of yourself, because you didn't be selfish in the request that you offered, I will give you great wisdom. And today, wisdom is found in Solomon. He's considered one of the wisest men that ever lived upon the earth. And he writes this passage, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So he wants you to understand that the company you keep is also going to determine if you're a wise person or if you're a fool. And so this morning, the passage of Scripture is going to teach us about two friends, two friends that are really not the friends that you should have. Their name is selfish ambition and bitter jealousy. And these companions are not to be found in our company. They are things that we should make sure that we keep separate from, that we make sure that they don't fall into our company. And we need to understand that these two things, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, destroy everything around them. It ruins relationships. I was reading a story from NPR this week about a, a young musician from Canada who was a clarinetist, and he uh, was a, almost a prodigy, and he was having the opportunity to go to California and sit under one of the greatest clarinetists in the world at the Colburn Conservatory. So he flew to California, performed his recital in front of the man that he wanted to sit under, and he was then going to wait for the results. So he went back home to Toronto, and he uh, waited there, and his girlfriend had been with him and, and had the opportunity to have access to his email and have access to his computer. So she hopped onto the computer a few weeks later and found the acceptance letter written from this man to her boyfriend. And because she was filled with self, selfish ambition, bitter jealousy, she deleted the email 
and even created a Gmail account in the name of this famous teacher and wrote him a rejection letter. Sent it with her own uh, computer but using a fake Gmail account and he received this rejection letter even though he had actually been accepted into the program. And so she began this deception and he sat there and was uh, completely destroyed by the fact that he didn't get the opportunity to be there. And a few months later, he wasn't going to give up on his dreams, so he flew back to California to now do a recital for another musician. He was a lesser known uh, artist, but he then performed for there. But the man that he wanted to sit under was there watching the recital, and he went up to the young man afterwards, and he said, why did you reject my, uh, my invitation to come and stutter under me? I've never had a student do that before. And he's, turned to him and he said, I didn't reject you, you rejected me. And they never settled the story there as they were in company of one another in California. He went back home and he began to get suspicious. He had now broken up with his girlfriend and he then remembered her password and logged into her account and found the letter and found that she had used her phone number to confirm the Gmail account in the name of this famous musician. So he sent that letter back to California to, to this man, and he actually took her to court and sued her. And that's why the article was written last week, because the courts awarded him a large sum of money because of what she had done. She had destroyed his hopes and dreams, and the judge was aghast with what he saw. And so he laid it on her and made sure she never showed up to the court case. They don't know where she is. She's hiding somewhere in Canada. He has no idea if he'll ever be able to claim the amount of uh, reward that was going to be given to him. But he then was able to go back and study under this man. And now he's one of the principal clarinetists in the Toronto Symphony today. But all of the delay, all of the suddenness, and you see what selfish ambition and bitter jealousy will do. And James wants to show you that little story and tell you that little story to, for you to see what kind of company they will be in your life and how destroying they can be. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition will destroy anything and they will produce great harm in your life. And jealousy and selfish ambition are really the fruit of a heart that is not following Jesus Christ. And so James wants you to know what true wisdom looks like. He wants you to understand what it is. So if you have your Bibles with you, let's read this passage this morning. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Who is wise among you and understanding? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly and it's unspiritual and it's demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure and peaceable and gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, and impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray. Oh, Father, you have, in this passage of Scripture, given us the comparison of a heart without Christ and a heart that has been shaped by Christ. So, Father, we pray that we would be wise in our understanding of knowing where our heart is in relationship to you. You're examining our heart this morning through this passage of Scripture, and you're reminding us of the great fruit of the gospel that is in our life because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Because he's done for us what we could not do for ourselves, we now are able to live this way according to your Scriptures, to live in wisdom, and to walk in your ways and to cherish purity and gentleness and peaceable lifestyle, open to reason and full of mercy and of good fruits and impartial and sincere. Lord, we understand that those things cannot be achieved in our own efforts and in our own performance, but only through the work of Jesus Christ in us. 
and the power of the Holy Spirit working in us, then fruit of the Spirit will be evident in our life. And so we desire to be wise. We desire to have the right companions in our life for your glory and for your sake. So we pray in the hearing of your word this morning that we be challenged according to your word to live in light of what Christ has done for us. May we lift him high in our life and in our conduct and in our actions, all for your glory, we pray. Amen. So James starts off by saying, if anyone is wise or understanding, come forward. I want you to stand before me. And then he says, I want, you to t- I want to tell you what wisdom truly looks like. And he wants you to think about yourself. What do you think wisdom looks like? And James is going to say, look at a person's life. Look at their conduct, the way they act. And that's going to be evident that they're wise or if they're a fool. And so if we use the illustration of this girl that destroyed her boyfriend's dreams, we can see how foolish she was and how unwise she was in relationship and how she did such great harm and how selfish ambition was the driving force behind her to do something so immoral as the secular judge said and so disgusting. He couldn't believe that someone would do this in this person's life. And that should be the reaction when we see selfish ambition and bitter jealousy. That's the response that we should have when we see it evident in the lives of people around us. And James wants you to understand what you should be pursuing is the fruit of the gospel that he lays out in the latter parts of the verses that we have here. But he wants you to know this, that look at a person's life and it's going to tell you if they're wise or if they're a fool. You're going to be able to tell in what they do. So first Peter is going to tell the same thing. Peter says this, keep your conduct among the Gentiles or the outsiders honorable so that when they speak against you as evil doers, they may see your good deeds and glorify your father on the day of visitation. And Jesus is going to say the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light so shine, let your uh, light and salt be so evident that when people look at you, they're going to see your Father in heaven and bring glory to his name. So our conduct has a way of glorifying the Lord. What you do today in the shopping mall or at the restaurant or tomorrow at work, whatever you do, that the Lord is going to be seen and displayed by the way you live your life. And wisdom is going to be evident in your conduct. So when you go to work tomorrow, and if you're cutting the corners in your shop, if you're trying to rewrite the book so that it's more advantage to you, you begin to see that selfish ambition has begun to rule your heart. Or maybe bitter jealousy occurs in the workplace because you see somebody else and you look at what they've been able to achieve and you can't stand it because your heart is aching and you wish that you had it yourself. And we begin to see how it begins to destroy the workplace. Or think about the relationship between a husband and wife and mix in between it bitter jealousy where there's a lack of trust between husband and wife. When there's a lack of trust between children and parents, we begin to see what bitter jealousy will do. It will destroy these relationships. It will erode it. But James is trying to explain to you that wisdom, when it's gained, when it's prayed for, and when you've run to Jesus and asked for wisdom, then wisdom is going to start permeating the workplace. It's going to start permeating your marriage. It's going to start permeating your relationship with your children. And there, birthed in the fruit of the gospel, we begin to see true life in the way that the Lord intended you to have and describes to you, and he asks you, if you want this kind of life, just ask, and the Lord will be ready and open to give you wisdom from his hand. So James wants you to understand that selfish ambition and bitter jealousy, listen to how he describes it. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, it's unspiritual, and he even calls it demonic. I really think that's what the judge was wishing he could say to that girl who destroyed her boyfriend's career. Of how horrible that was. But James is reminding you what kind of wisdom that is based on if you're bitter and jealous and envious 
If you're selfish in all of your ambitions and pursuits, it's earthly, it's unspiritual, and it's demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. So we read for our call to worship this morning, if you have your bulletins, look at the passage that we read from Philippians chapter 2 a famous passage about what Jesus Christ has done for us, where he has come from heaven down into our world, living in our own neighborhood. He becomes one that walks in our our midst. He takes on our flesh, and he then tells us in Philippians, Paul wants you to understand that we should have the same mind of Christ, doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but humility, regard others as better than yourselves. So if you're a follower of Jesus, that's the fruit that's to be evident in your life, not selfish ambition and bitter jealousy. They're at odds with one another. And if you're following Jesus, then it's at odds with your conduct, if that's what's there. And so as the scriptures speak to your heart this morning, you begin to see some of the jealousy that's arisen in your heart or the ambition that you try to seek after and you might walk over people in order to accomplish a better career for yourself, then the scriptures are showing you that you're not following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. You don't have the same mind as Jesus Christ. And Paul wants you to cry out for that same mind and that same understanding and understand Jesus in this way and live and reflect him in your conduct. Show yourself visible in that way. So the scriptures are pointing to your heart. So how do you rid yourself of selfish ambition and bitter jealousy? It's not just by saying, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna get better at doing this. I'm gonna make it a goal that I'm gonna defeat self-ambition and I'm gonna destroy bitter jealousy. It's not as if you can have self-determination to make this happen. You need to understand that you need to run to Jesus Christ and you need to hold on to the gospel. This is where the gospel starts to pour into your life and shows you the very need of Jesus Christ, that it's not just the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ that you need. You need the daily infusion of the gospel message to you, to understand that daily you need to preach the gospel to yourself that what Jesus has done for you, you could have never done for yourself. And so if you go about trying to just better yourself and get a self-help book from Barnes and Noble, and you walk through that section and see a book that will say, how to conquer jealousy and self-ambition, I want you to understand that that pursuit will lead you to no satisfaction. Because what is truly needed is for you to understand the power of the gospel that transforms lives, it changes everything. You've heard me say that over and over again. That the gospel starts to erode the selfish ambition to destroy the old patterns of your life, the old nature, and now you're putting on the new. Remember James told us to wax on and wax off like Karate Kid? Putting on the old, I'm putting off the old and putting on the new, and so now you are following in Jesus Christ's footsteps, you're becoming new, and over and over again, the power of the Holy Spirit starts enabling you to defeat those selfish ambitions that rise up in certain occasions. So when you would see the acceptance letter from one of the world's great clarinetists, you wouldn't be unhappy for your boyfriend to have that opportunity, you would shout with glee and joy and celebrate the occasion. That's what selfless life looks like. That we don't sit there and envy the people that get the awards at work or maybe the advancement, that we're able to rejoice with them even though we may not experience that and wish we could have had it for ourselves because this is what bitter jealousy looks like. My professor said it this way, envy is a painful and resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed by another person. Let me say that again. Envy is a painful and resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed by another person, accompanied by a strong desire to possess that advantage. It's a problem in every profession. Doctors envy other doctors. Secretaries envy other secretaries. Homemakers envy other homemakers. Salesmen envy other salesmen. Pastors envy 
other pastors. Think about this week when we go to General Assembly and think about how much bitter jealousy could be in the midst of our gathering as we sit there and compare the size of our congregation to one another. And so he goes on to say, students compare grades, clothes, appearance, and athletic ability. We compare husbands and wives, boyfriends and girlfriends, sons and daughters. And that's what we have, that's the culture that we live in. And we sometimes allow that selfish ambition and envy to seep back into our life. And James wants you to ask for wisdom. Wisdom so that you'd be able to see that that's come back and crept into your life that that's starting to eat away at your heart. So that even as you sit here this morning and you hear this sermon, that the Lord is using the Spirit to point to your heart and show you that you have some of this commonality with what James is describing, and you then desire to run back to Jesus Christ and hold on to the gospel, and you preach it to yourself over and over again to understand that the power to defeat selfish ambition and bitter envy and jealousy is found in what Jesus Christ has done for us. So he wants you to understand bitter jealousy. He also wants you to understand what selfish ambition looks like. It's riddled in all of our life. It's that self-centered heart that considers everything for ourself. So when the girl sees that, she doesn't want him to go. She'd rather have him for herself, and so she destroys his life, destroys his work, and then it looks out for herself. And that's what selfish ambition does. It makes us look out for ourselves. When Jesus has just told us, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others greater than yourselves. Only the gospel will enable you to think and to live that way. And James wants you to understand what wisdom truly is. It will be seen in your conduct. It will be seen in the way that you relate to your coworker, in the way that you work in your marriage and in relationship to your children. Wisdom will be self-evident and seen there. Self-interest and self-ambition boasts and it cares only for itself and no one else. And Jesus calls his people and his church to care for those outside of us, to even care for our enemy. It's one of the hard lessons that Jesus teaches us, that our love can even be directed even to those who have hurt us, and only with Christ in our life are we able to love in that kind of way, a bold love that Jesus Christ gives to you and me because of the gospel, because Jesus on the cross displayed a bold love for you and me. And if you think it's impossible, then look to the cross. That's what James wants you to do. He wants you to go back and think about what Jesus has done for us. Listen to what Paul wrote to the Corinthians about this. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what was low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became, listen to this, to us, the wisdom from God. James and Paul want you to understand that wisdom is found in Jesus Christ, and listen to what Paul says. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Oh, the world is filled of people that boast about themselves. Just watch a football game. Just watch a sport like hockey. I would encourage you to do that a little bit more often. But as you see, you're going to see the Stanley Cup winners. What have we been watching for the last two weeks with Washington boasting in their win? It's great to enjoy the celebration. But think about the selfish ambition that might be behind some of the celebration. 
Think about the bitter jealousy that might have arrived to that point. And James and Paul and Jesus are going to tell us, listen, when we understand the power of the gospel in our life, we don't boast about what we have been able to accomplish. We begin to see that all that we have accomplished has been a gift from God's hand. That's what James told us a few verses ago. And he said, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. And that's what we need to remember. That's wisdom. And when you begin to boast in what you've been able to accomplish in your life and you look at your house and say, look at what I've been able to achieve. And when you speak to your friends and say, look at the job that I've been able to have. And you're really telling them so that they would be impressed by what you're doing. That's again how the heart begins to seep back into bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And Jesus is then going to model for you and me the type of life that he wants us to live. One who would come in humble means. He didn't go after the nobles. He went after the least and the lost. And he entered this world as one of the least and the lost. He's entered the world into a manger in Bethlehem, a bed not made for him. But he's put into a feeding trough as a baby the same trough that would have been used for the donkeys and the cattle that would have been eating out of that for food. And this is where the savior of the world is born. This one who would (laughs) mount a cross so that we would then have life more abundantly. And this is the way he came into this world. He came into this world not seeking his own self-interest, but he came into this world seeking your greatest interest. And your greatest need he met as he sat there and allowed men to accuse him of false crimes and allow them to penetrate his hands and his feet with nails. And to allow his blood to then spill, allow them to spit on his face, to put a crown of thorns to mock his kingdom because he even said he was the king who had come. And so Pilate makes sure that there's a sign over his head that said, here is the king of the Jews. And they cried out on that cross, if you're the king of the Jews, then just come down and destroy us. And yet he willingly allowed himself to hang there until he met his greatest end. And he was forsaken by God so that you and me would never be forsaken by God. And by doing that, he did what we could never do for ourselves. And now we have the relationship with God and we can go to him and pray and ask for this wisdom and the Lord is gonna give it to you. So my professor in seminary said this, why is the message of the cross the source of true wisdom? Because it was at the cross that Jesus solved our sin problem. It was at the cross that he took upon himself the punishment we deserve for all our bitter envy and our selfish ambition. And because of his death and resurrection, for we can now have not only deliverance from sin's penalty, but also the deliverance from sin's crippling power so that we are able to cast aside selfish ambition and bitter jealousy. Because of the cross, you can now set free from your bondage to envy and self-centeredness, so that you can enter now into this new kind of life, the fullness of life called true wisdom. That is a life that is marked by love, ongoing love for God and selfless love for others. I wish that girl who destroyed her boyfriend's hopes and dreams would be able to hear the gospel news that can even restore her, who's hiding, who's hoping no one would find her, probably wondering about what has happened. I wonder if she has remorse or has the selfish ambition and the bitter jealousy eaten away in her heart so that she has no conscience for what she's done. And maybe the gospel would be able to be heard by her heart and unveil to her that Jesus Christ can even cover over the multitude of her sin because he would be one who would come even for her, just as he came for you and me. And because of our bitter envy and our jealousy, he allowed himself to be nailed to the cross to solve our problem 
and to give us the greatest of joy. And so James wants to tell you about the fruit of the gospel. Instead of selfish ambition and bitter jealousy, this is what you become because of the gospel. You become pure, it's another word for holy, that it was allowing you to be in the presence of God because now, because of Christ, you can be seen as pure before this almighty God where sin would never stand in his presence. It also tells us, James said, that this fruit of the gospel will make you peaceable, that you would love to bring an end to the quarrel that you see, but so often we love to continue the quarrel on and we might feed the fire for that fight to continue going. We might do it because we are selfish in our desires and we often inflict pain and hurt by the words we use, just as we learned last week about the taming of the tongue and how hard it is. But James is also gonna tell you that it's also gentle, tolerant and considerate of others. It's also open to reason, meaning that you're willing to listen to other people. And remember what he said earlier in the passage of James? Be quick to listen and slow to speak. And that is going to make you open to reason. You're gonna be full of mercy. The cares and worries of people around you are gonna be more important sometimes than the cares and worries of your own and that you would be people who show mercy to one another. That's what God's church is to look like, full of mercy and then good fruits. And we all hear in Galatians where Paul tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is going to be, so it's going to be evident in our life. And it's also going to teach us to be impartial, that we are going to hold back our favoritism. Where James told us earlier, if you bring people into your church and you give them the front row seat because they look wealthy, and you then tell the one who's poor, sit in the back uh, bleachers, or sit on the floor in the back. You've shown favoritism, and Jesus is telling us through that whole story that favoritism would not be what we do, that we're impartial people, and that we're sincere, we're not phony. And so often the criticism of the church has been that we are phony people sitting in the pews on Sunday, and a very different person on Monday through Saturday. So again, the fruit of the gospel can only come to you through your pursuing and running after Jesus and the cross. That's what James wants you to hear where true wisdom is found. My professor said it this way. In fact, the liberal in the church or the humanist in society often demonstrates a greater degree of love for his fellow man than does the person who cites chapter and verse from the pages of the Bible. Unfortunately, Christians frequently give the world the impression that they're more interested in strife and confrontation than in peace and love. During his earthly ministry, Jesus opposed sin and publicly rebuked spiritual leaders of Israel. Yet the moral and social outcasts, the prostitutes and the tax collectors experienced the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and they knew that he was peace, that he was loving, that he was considerate, that he was sincere, that he was submissive, full of mercy and of good fruit and impartial and sincere, and yet he was pure holiness. And so Jesus invites us to have the same mind as he did, to live that kind of way. And James is telling you, this is what true wisdom looks like. Look at your conduct, examine your heart, and run to the cross. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the power of your words. Continue to show us our desperate need for Jesus Christ in all of life. Oh, Lord, help us to not live uh, the Christian life in a way where we we use the, the Christian life to get us into heaven and then we go on living our life any way that we want to. That's cheap grace that you've described. And so, Father, remind us that this new way of living is now ours and the power to conquer selfish ambition and jealousy is right in the power of the cross and seen in Jesus in our life. Oh, Father, may we have his mind in our mind. And may we walk the way he walked. May we resemble him and look like him, for we were made in your image for your glory to live and worship you in all of your ways. So, Father, we pray that you would give us great wisdom, wisdom to know how to navigate life, that it would not be earthly wisdom, but it would be wisdom from above. So may you use our minds 
and may you use us to think and contemplate the cross and run to it in our desperate need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.